Welcome back to our Holidays with Our Heroes series here on Eco Ask Why. As you know by now, between here and Christmas, you're going to hear inspiring stories week in and week out from our heroes as we celebrate this wonderful time of year together. And there's a big surprise coming on the week of Christmas, and you do not want to miss it. Now, on this particular episode, I sat down with Daniel Harrington from Voxel Innovations. And you may remember Daniel from episode 160, where he talked about pulsed electrochemical machining. That was just a, such an, an interesting episode because it's a technology that's completely new to me and many of our listeners. And you're going to find out in this episode that Daniel's story started in his garage and has taken him all the way to Voxel, and it's an absolutely incredible story. Now, speaking of stories, we are getting those war stories, and they are incredible. We're, we're getting the good, we're getting the funny, we're getting the inspirational, and remember, those are the stories that you sit around and you tell at the dinner table. Maybe you tell them at a cocktail party, right? So get those to us, check out the show notes for the links, and you can figure out how to get that directly to us via uh, DM on Instagram or Facebook. Now, it's time to get some insight into Daniel Harrington's amazing journey. Cue the music. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode. I'm very excited to have with me Mr. Daniel Harrington, who's the CEO at Voxel Innovation. So welcome, Daniel. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. How you doing, man? Great. Great. Now, you are located in Raleigh. I got to come see your shop a few months ago, and it was such an um, eye-opening experience for me. I had to invite you on, you know, so excited to, to hear more about your story here today, and just thank you for taking the time with us. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys. Very cool, very cool. Now, we love these hero conversations, Daniel, and we like to get them started with just hearing about your journey uh, to where you're at right now. Sure. Yeah, so uh, I'm currently the CEO of Voxel Innovations. I started that company about five years ago. But uh, if you kind of roll back the clock a little ways, yeah. you know, I, I started um, really in Raleigh here. I went to NC State to get my undergraduate degree uh, in mechanical engineering. Go so I, I finished. Yeah, that's right. go, go pack. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm here on Tar Hill Drive right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> that could be but, interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, so got a mechanical engineering degree there and graduated in 2009. But actually, while I was in undergraduate and after graduate school or undergraduate school, I was a, a professional race car driver as well. And so I was doing that in tandem with my, my school um, and then continued that professionally for a few years afterwards. Um, it turns out in 2010, it's pretty hard to raise sponsorship dollars in the yeah. recession. Uh, <laughs> And I had all this passion for engineering, manufacturing, technology, and ultimately went back to graduate school at Duke University and got a degree in engineering management. Okay. And it's kind of like an MBA for engineers, uh, a really compact, accelerated one-year program that was a great fit for me. And then left and went to work at the Department of Energy at an agency called RPE, which is the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. Okay. <laughs> it's, good, it's a mouthful. As a mouthful the there. Acronyms are. <laughs> um, and that was a, a fantastic experience. I, I learned a lot about different um, technologies that people are working on to um, improve energy efficiency or develop a new type of turbine or new transportation mode, uh, but really inspired me to think a little bit about how those manufacturing or those innovations came to be and really manufacturing is at a core of lots of them and yeah. you know without manufacturing you couldn't uh, even dream up some of these ideas that were being proposed and and developed and in fact if you could create innovations around manufacturing uh, you could help drive new innovations in energy technology or transportation or, or wherever uh, so that really got my passion going for this manufacturing space. I started doing some consulting and worked for a while with a company called Medum in New Jersey. They um, they drill cooling holes and in industrial gas turbine blades. They're now part of GE Power. And it was at that company where I was introduced to this electrochemical machine process. Um, and I really was inspired about 
the value of this technology, how underutilized it was in the U.S. And uh, long story short, I ended up starting a business here in, in the U.S. to really focus on that technology. I saw it as an underserved opportunity. And yeah, I, five years ago, I, I started the business myself in a garage, um, hired one other guy you know, six or nine months later, and slowly been growing since then, building our own equipment and finding new applications for this technology. Wow. That's a really cool story, man. Now we got to unpack some of it here before we go any further. So Wolfpack undergrad, Duke grad, and Voxels on Tar Heel Drive. So man, you are all over the place, right? Yeah, I'm a mess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one more thing, I gotta go here, man, because I, I'm a I used to, to to dabble in race cars myself. So I gotta unpack this for our listeners. What type of racing were you doing? Uh well, anything that would let me drive, <laughs> but <laughs> mostly I was focused on uh indie light. So it's a step okay. below indie car. Yeah. Uh, Open wheel. <laughs> open wheel cars and I did sports cars as well. So at the time it was Grand Am series, which is now IMSA and yeah. uh, really just fishing for any sort of ride I could get, you know, uh, but the open wheel cars was where I spent most of my time went through a couple different ladder series started with, it was called formula BMW and then formula Mazda and then Indy lights. Yeah. Uh, slowly progressing along the way, winning a few races here and there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd be lying if I told you I didn't miss it from time to time. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I mean, we, I used to do a lot with late models, NASCAR, you know, trucks. I mean, never got into the higher levels, but, uh, but yeah, man, fun stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a great, um, learning experience as well. I mean, it, it sort of set me up for business in some ways and that, you know, that is a hyper competitive environment and you see right in front of your eyes, a team that's doing better than you and you try to understand what they're doing better, how you can change their, their operation or your company to outcompete them the next time. That's right. And it, it's sort of an immediate feedback for how well you're doing both personally, but also as in a team environment and your competitiveness as a, in that industry. There, there are a lot of business analogies and ties that you can make to racing. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, very cool. Very cool. And at Voxel, you've been doing, doing that for five years. So you're, you're probably still cranking quite a few uh, energy drinks and keeping things going, but you, you seems like you guys are really making some strides. And I'm curious, what are you seeing right now? As some of the biggest challenges for your industry in particular? Yeah, so you know, we are facing two challenges primarily. One is uh, just education about what electrochemical and pulsed electrochemical machining is. Okay, yeah. that's a big piece of what we're trying to do here is educate the U.S. market that a this process exists and b it's got these value propositions and c we can help you do it you know right uh, and so without people understanding what uh, the process is or even knowing it exists it's going to be really hard for them to spec your process into their operation or to their component design okay so that, there's an education piece that's a big challenge for us and the second is just scale you know we're still a small business you know, you know just under 10 people here uh, growing, you know, we, we have aspirations and plans to be quite a bit bigger than that, but, um, we're small. And so that means you, you go talk to a GE or Pratt and Whitney, you're small peanuts to them. Uh, so you've got to really impress them with technology. And that's really been our focus trying to develop innovative, uh, valuable processes and technologies so that they can't overlook you, that you can bring something to the table that they can't ignore. Um, whether you're, two people or 500 people, you know, that, that value of the technology uh, is really what shines through in some of these cases. So that's been our focus here. Okay. I mean, it, it, very common challenges. You'll get that scale, no doubt, because you guys have a wonderful solution and you just got to find that right uh, partnerships to get those in place. And I know things will, will be, you know, take off for you guys. And we love Daniel to give the people listening advice for their careers you know and so somebody sees you as the ceo of voxel and they want to, they want to to embrace that entrepreneurial spirit and and take that road themselves what advice would you offer up someone listening i don't think too hard about it okay <laughs> you, you kind of just gotta jump in um i like to tell people that i was just dumb enough to start a business you know if i if you told me all those things i know now five years ago i i might not have started it you know? right right you you kind of have to 
take it on faith that there's an opportunity here. That's that's kind of what it's all about. You believe that there's an opportunity and you'll figure out the problems along the way. But if you know what all the problems are and spend too much time finding them, it might discourage you. Uh, so that's maybe one piece of advice. Um, the second is to really focus on what you're passionate about. You know, I, um, manufacturing has really grown to be a, a passion of mine. You'll find all my social media. All I do is look at manufacturing related things. Um, there's something about making a physical, tangible object that's really appeals to me. And, and, but if your passion is software, you know, follow that. If it's in healthcare, follow that. You know, there's no replacing that. Um, you won't be able to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week uh, if you don't have that passion for what you're doing. And you'll just have to, that's kind of part of it. Um, that's right. And then third, find some trusted friends, advisors, mentors, you know, someone to keep you grounded during that time. You know, right. um, I, I ended up starting the business by myself. Um, I think it's very common for people to start with partners as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if I had to do it all over again, I might have tried to find two other partners to start the business with because you've constantly got that um, sort of network of people that are in the day-to-day -day weeds with you that you can lean on uh, that I don't have right now, but I've tried to make up for that with really good mentors and advisors that they can tell me whether I'm crazy or I'm on the right path. Right. <laughs> Some perspective is also always helpful. That, that does help. Now, how about those mentors? Because we love to hear about them. I am curious because as a CEO, you know, who, who do you let speak into your life, into the career, to to the business there? So, any anything you like to share there around mentors? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, uh, you'll see some of them listed on our website there. But my first one was one of my professors at Duke University. Also had some entrepreneurial experience as well. Um, you know, first I'd say the common theme along all my mentors is I've been lucky enough that they have, they're just genuinely interested in my success. Right. And that's what you want. Yeah. You know, people that are there to, they'd probably give you advice, pick up the phone, no matter what, you know, whether you're sort of formally one of their advisors or, or not. Um, that's the most critical thing is to make sure they're passionate about seeing you succeed mm -hmm. uh, no matter what happens. Um, and really it's just been, some of my mentors are people that I've looked up to. They started businesses in the past, manufacturing businesses. Um, they were successful. Uh, they sold them to GE or Pratt and Whitney. And I've just blindly called them and reached out to them and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing on a similar track to you. I want to learn a little bit about what you did, what did and didn't work. Um, just pick your brain a bit and sort of start a relationship that way, you know? Now, yeah. good for you. Did that? Does that work? Because I, I, I love to hear people say that because some people challenge me on that. But there's nothing better than just being purely, you know, humble and just asking yeah. for advice. I mean, first, the worst thing they could say is no. Right. And then, you know, <laughs> you know there, there's kind of no risk there. And, and second, I'm constantly trying to learn. I, you know, it'd be foolish of me to think that I, I hadn't started a business until I started this one. So, right. Uh, it's not like I was born with some innate uh know-how of how to right. run a business so I, I need to go learn from people and you know but it's also important to recognize that every business has its own path and mm -hmm. you're you're on your own journey um so listen to their advice they probably have good advice but you still have to make your own decision at the end of the day and it, it might be different and the most interesting and rewarding thing i found over time is that uh, those advisors also appreciate you making your own decisions and they'll support right. you. If you come with good reasons, say, listen, I heard what you said. I think we're going to go this direction. They'll, they might say, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a good reason good yeah. direction to go. So I, I reach out to people all the time, whether it's on technology or business or whatever, you know, I, I'm constantly trying to learn something new. That's great. Now you doing a lot of that through social media or different or different areas, LinkedIn. I'm just curious on where, where do you find it works the best for the listener that may, Hey, they want to start doing that more, but they just don't know where to start. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to think how I've met some of these people. Um, some of them I've scoured the internet and found their email somewhere and just blindly emailed them. Right. Got lucky that way. Some of them I've, I've uh, 
approached at conferences, you know, industry conferences I've gone up to and uh, been able to uh, grab five minutes at a time to sort of talk about what we're doing and, and ask them a few questions. Um, I've used LinkedIn a time or two, but um, often people that are mentors are quite busy and they get lots of LinkedIn messages. Right. And so um, you might just be adding to their clutter and to some extent. Um, you can also just call call the office, talk to it. You know, sometimes they've got an assistant, plead your case with the assistant. You might get a shot or at least be able to leave them a message. You know, um, it's amazing how many you people forget we can still pick up the phone and call people, right? It's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's in some ways the best people, way to get a hold of people these days because people are getting hundreds of emails a day. They're getting bombarded on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a phone call is, uh, means a lot more than a uh, sort of anonymous email message. That's uh, right. So uh, that can be a real value. <clears throat> well, good. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I, I don't think we really haven't walked down that path from a mentor standpoint for our listeners. So that's some great points, some great advice. Now, a lot of times when you're in the engineering world and you've done engineering at Duke, you've done it at NC state, there's a lot of stigma with engineers and I like I love to give people the opportunity to to knock something out the park here. Is there any common myths that you like to demit to, to debunk uh, around engineering? Uh, so one that's sort of specific to manufacturing, really. Okay. I don't know if it's a myth, but it's a reality that I keep facing is that at the beginning of this design process. So if you're working on a jet engine or a medical device or what what have you. As you start designing the concept of your part, you are designing the manufacturing process at the same time, whether you know it or not. Okay. Yeah, right. So you're, yeah. you're sitting there designing a part and you might be not thinking at all about manufacturing, in which case it's kind of the worst scenario because, you know, when it hits the manufacturing floor, they're going to send it back and say, we can't do this or it's going to cost 10 times as much. Um, but the, the better engineers and the more empowered engineers, are the ones that have a good grasp of the manufacturing processes and what it does. And they, and they actually bring manufacturing in early in the design phase. Um, and to go along with that, you need to make sure you educate yourself on all the different manufacturing processes that are out there. If not, you, you might be missing out. You might be making a part that's suboptimal or more expensive than it needs to be just because you're unaware of some technology or mm-hmm. technique out there. So, you know, I think commonly people think of engineers as just sitting in front of a computer all day, dreaming up an impossible to make part out of their head. That does happen sometimes, unfortunately, but the best engineers are the ones that are out, understand the full value chain. You know, they understand what the materials are they're using. They understand the manufacturing processes to make them, the costs of those things. You know, The more the engineer can understand the economics that happen, that's just a reality of our world. And, uh, you can't design parts that cost a thousand times more than they should. And, you know, they'll never get made. Right. So, that's right. Uh, so that's the that's maybe more advice than anything else. But it, uh, I love it. it is, yeah, you did a great job there, Daniel. And you know, uh, something that for our young engineers to definitely consider as they move forward. And I am curious as this, as the CEO. You know, you, you're doing so many innovative things. I mean, it's in the it's in the name of your company, Voxel Innovations. When are you the happiest? You know, when are you getting that fulfillment uh, in your day? And you can come on with the end of the day and be like, you know what, today was awesome, and it's because of this. Yeah, I mean, it, it probably happens just when we have been working really hard on a process and finally get the tangible part to come out the other side the way we want. Yeah. You know. Yep. This process is is difficult. It takes grit and perseverance to get through it and sort of do the development on the front end. Yeah, things happen that are unexpected all the time. But when the part comes out and it looks fantastic, I mean that's the most rewarding feeling. And the thing that's neat is when when we do that and we do it right, you can just push a button and do it again. Yeah, you know, right. Once right. we figure out the the formula there, we can repeat it pretty quickly. And so, so that's been a um, that's probably when I'm most happiest. Um, and maybe a close second of that is showing that to the customer, you know, when you can solve their problem, yeah. that's why we exist is to help solve these customer problems. And, you know, learning about it on the front end is really exciting. You learn about a new market or application and some problem they're having yeah. uh, and being able to show that you can 
actually address it at the end. Uh, those are quite rewarding um, experiences. Now, take me take me back to that eight. What did you say? Eight hundred square foot garage, and you made that first part, and it made those, and it came out to the specs that you wanted. What did that feel like, man? Yeah, well, at first I was, I, so the first part I made was just, it was kind of garbage, but it worked. <laughs> you know, we made a part. Um, and I was at first just surprised it worked. You know, it, I basically set up this whole process. It was a pretty simple operation, but um, I got kind of lucky that I turned the thing on and it made a part kind of like I expected the first time out. I, so I was a little bit shocked. Uh, I think that was, um, first time lucky sort of experience because the next time I tried to make a part, it didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, I, I'd spent a lot of time, you know, <laughs> right. It, probably two years of time thinking about how we make this process work, learn about it, talking to people in the market and industry about it, you know, time in previous roles, learning about it. So it was a long time coming to make that first part, but, uh, you know, very rewarding once you do it. I bet. I bet. Well, I mean, hats off to what you're doing, and we love to take these hero episodes, Daniel, and, and get a little bit outside of work and talk about what you enjoy doing for fun. We already know that you're a race car driver, but maybe we'll keep we'll open it up a little bit more. What what hobbies do you have? Uh, lots of hobbies, not a lot of time. Okay. Because, you know, I, when I do have a few bit, a little bit of time, I try and be pretty active, play volleyball, basketball bike riding, you know, anything I can yeah. sort of competitive do with my friends. That's probably the competitive race car driver in me. Uh, enjoy that, that piece of it. I also am, a, I do a little bit of woodworking at my shop and okay. here in Raleigh, just in my, uh, sort of shed out back. Uh, don't have enough time to do that these days, but, um, would feel woodworking feels so easy compared to uh, what I do on a day to day basis. I know it's not, I'm not doing good quality stuff, but yeah. You know, well, your tolerances are a lot different, right? They're a lot different. You know, a <laughs> uh, thumb whip widths is good that's enough. Right. For Just me get, to, give me a hammer, baby. And let that thing. We're going to make it work. You know, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and you can go out and make something in one day. And it, uh, that's right. You know, so there's some, some instant sort of reward there from doing that. So I, those are probably my main hobbies today. Okay, cool. So if you had to pick a sport, you mentioned uh, volleyball, basketball. Is volleyball your number one? Uh, basketball is the sport that I probably enjoy most and okay. uh, uh, follow the most. You know, I end up watching NBA and college basketball. But um, uh, that tarmac is getting painful on my knees. So yeah. that sand volleyball has been what I've been doing most recently because it uh, means I can walk the next day. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Now, how about uh, w w things you enjoy consuming for fun? It could be podcasts, YouTube. You already mentioned you love binging uh, manufacturing type content or or books out there that you think our listeners may find value in. And this this could be stuff you enjoy personal or professional as well. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, I, I, I have an Instagram account. I don't think I follow a single friend on it. All I do is follow other manufacturing companies. And it's been kind of neat actually, because you see what some other high tech companies doing, whether they're a machine tool builder or a job shop or something. Yeah. You kind of learn a few things here or there, just watching it. And it can be inspiring. You know, uh, I have a, a, probably a secret YouTube addiction, maybe not so secret to my, my partner, but she, uh, she understands. So, I, but that's largely sort of, people that are building things is the best way to describe it. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes they're wild and wacky inventions. Sometimes it's other manufacturing channels. Um, uh, so uh, you can tell I've got a little bit of theme here on the things I consume. Yeah. yeah. Um, I listened to a couple of podcasts, uh, Planet Money from NPR, it's kind of interesting to keep up with the economic side of things. Um, but, uh, and then I, I do read a fair bit, you know, for fun, it's mostly, um, uh, sci-fi books, sort okay. of hard sci-fi is, is my genre, I'd say. Um, okay. uh, but also a fair bit of nonfiction. So um, a couple of books I've read recently that were quite enjoyable were um, Why We Sleep. Uh, okay. So it goes into science of sleep and basically describes how none of us get enough of it and, and what a detriment it is to our uh, our, our lifestyle. Um, 
So uh, I highly recommend that book to anyone that's, that's listening. Very good. And we'll make sure we put those links in our show notes too for while we sleep. I haven't heard that one yet, so I have to uh, check that out myself. Yeah, good. Very cool. Now, we do something, Daniel, in the Hero episodes. I love it. Our, our listeners love it. It's called a lightning round. Just a bunch of random stuff. I'm going to fire at you and just whatever comes to your uh, f- uh, front of mind, let's just let's just go with that, okay? Okay. All right. So we'll st- I love starting easy. So what's your favorite food, Daniel? Probably tacos. Tacos. Man, my, my man, I hear you. How about adult beverage? Um. I've been doing a lot of Negronis and old fashions and that sort of thing these days. Daniel, we need to hang out more. I mean, come <laughs> on, you're, you're speaking my language. All right. All right. I am curious since you said the NBA. So what's your, what's your NBA team? You know, I, that's kind of a fun thing is in the NBA, we don't have an NBA team here in Raleigh, so I can just pull forever yep. I want. Um, so I just watching good games, you know, I, I did grow up in Winston-Salem. So I, I saw Chris Paul play through college. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wake Forest. So I keep tabs on him. It's fun to see him get to the finals with the Suns this year. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, mostly just seeking out good games. You I know? hear you. I did, well, those finals, they were some great games there and, yeah. you know, hats off to the Bucks. So, uh, good stuff there. How about the uh, all time favorite movie? Uh, it's got to be all the original Star Wars movies. <laughs> okay. Okay. What about a, an app you can't live without on your phone? Oh, uh, that's probably boring. It's my Outlook email. It's a connection to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm with you there. How about a, a guilty pleasure? Yeah, it's probably some of the wacky YouTube channels. Yeah. Okay. I'm not not so guilty, but there's a guy named Colin Furs. He's got a real popular YouTube channel. Cool. Uh, uh, that guy's great. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Now what about music? What type of music do you enjoy? Uh, a little bit of everything, you know, um, hip hop, classic rock, okay. uh, indie music. Uh, honestly, my partner, uh, feeds up more of that to me than, than I do. So I just sort of follow whatever she's been setting up on the playlist and listen to that. I got you. I got you. What about, uh, what's on your nightstand? Uh, I've got, uh, a book and a Kindle. Uh, okay. Mostly I read on the Kindle. Um, yeah, I think I read most recently um, uh, a recent Andy Weir book. So it's, that's the author that wrote The Martian, which turned into that movie with Matt yeah. Damon. Yeah. He had another book recently that I just finished up that was really enjoyable. Uh, same sort of style. Okay. Uh, and I forgot the name of it, unfortunately. It's <laughs> okay. My wife's a big Kindle user, so I, I can appreciate that because, I mean, the amount of books you can put on those, you're you're never without something to read, you know? That's right. Yeah, good for travel, too. Now, you have traveled a lot, it sounds like. So what, where's, what's the, the coolest place you've ever been? Um, you know, my favorite trip I ever did in the U.S. was rafting down the Grand Canyon. Oh, nice. And that was an amazing experience. Um middle of summer so it's screaming hot out during the day but the water is still ice cold yeah uh that probably still ranks up with one of my favorite trips um but the the coolest place i've been recently was i went to africa and when i did a little safari down there uh, with a bunch of my family and i mean it just felt that's sort of a once in a lifetime trip yeah. For, for yeah. Me, you know and um it felt surreal i felt like i was david attenborough out there you know, looking at all the lions and uh elephants and stuff up close in person i hear you that is so great now you are the first hero that we that we spoke to that has brought up africa as their their favorite destination man so that's awesome yeah it's pretty special um, okay now last question in lightning round man dogs or cats dogs all you right it. you got it right you got it right yeah. so we let you got, you, two, you got two big dogs i think they're uh both about 90 pounds. Ooh, what kind of dogs are they? Uh, they're both mutts. One's a lab mix of some sort. Yep. One's a, uh, a brown one. Okay, <laughs> yeah. a brown one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love it. Gotta love it. I'm a, we're definitely a dog dog family here. So, Dana, this has been great. Just getting to know you, the wonderful things you're doing at Voxel. Uh, for the listeners out there, check out the show notes. Connect with Daniel. Follow doc, uh, Voxel. See what they're doing. Uh, Daniel, we do call it Eco S Y, so I always end with the why, my friend. So somebody wants to know what your personal why is. What would that be? You know, my personal why why is probably all around 
solving problems with science. You know, I'm an engineer by training. Yep. And so I'm constantly, I mean, it's kind of silly, but I'm constantly asking why, you know, why is this thing not working the way it should? Yep. Why is it not as efficient as it should be? And that, that really drives me, you know, it helps me. That's why I started the business is I said, why there are not more ECM, PCM services here in the U S right. So that that's constantly on my mind. It's kind of an engineer's mindset is thinking about why this is one way, not the other and why it's not better. <laughs> I hear you. Well, it's, you're, you're doing a great job. You're definitely one of our heroes and we cannot thank you enough, Daniel, for taking the time out and sharing your story and your, your insights, your wisdom for our listeners out there and just really enjoyed getting to know you more. Great. Thank you, Chris. Good talking to you. You have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 